months of being married and you're newlyweds, you've just completely lost your sight and you have no answers of whether you're going to get it back or not. But it was my final year of med school, I started getting headaches, couldn't concentrate on books. So kind of put it down to, you know, my script probably needs to change on, 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 my, on, my, on my glasses. I was being told that my script was absolutely fine, there's no issues at all. It's just the fact that I've got my head buried in a book in, in a yeah. littered <laughs> library. And that's when I was diagnosed with a condition called keratoconus. The eczema still stayed up. We had dinner together. She went off to bed. Um, I stayed up for a few more hours to kind of just uh, watch a bit of TV, do some paperwork, went to bed. And what we didn't realise is there was pressure building up in the back of the eyes and the eyes literally went pop overnight. So I woke up in the morning. I, I felt absolutely nothing at all. My wife woke up to a bit of a horror show. Describing how it was, it was kind of like sinking to the bottom of the swimming pool as you're looking up so you can see the light. Yeah. You can see kind of ripples. Yeah. But that's it. It kind of gets darker and darker. As the, as, as the minutes went on, it just got darker and darker and darker and darker and darker. Well, if this is what my life is, if this is what my life is going to be like, one, I'm going to work through the pain. Two, I'm going to, I want to hold my head up high again. It was, can I, it, it, you know, in, in, in my head, it was, it was kind of playing the scenarios off. If I can't adapt, what happens to me? What happens to Seema? Yeah. If I, it, also, the, if Seema walked away, I wouldn't blame her. It was, it was, it was that, you know, all this, all this pressure I kind of put on her that if, you know. Did you ask her that question? everyone and welcome back to another episode of Millennial Mind. I have Kika with me today who is Amit's guide dog and she's asking you for a very tiny favour. If you haven't already, please press the like and subscribe button wherever you're listening to this podcast and we'll be very, very, very grateful. Amit, hello. Hello. Welcome to Millennial Mind. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to have you here today and your story was one that I heard in Parliament and I've never heard someone speak so well and so articulately. Kika's already tapping you to be like, I'm <laughs> it. <laughs> Don't forget <laughs> me. Attention. But I remember listening to your story and I messaged you on Instagram straight away and I spoke to your wife and I was like, I have to get you on my podcast. So I'm very happy to have you here today. No, th th thank you for reaching out. Um, yeah, no, it's, 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 uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really happy to have you. So there was a quote that I read when I was researching into your story. And it was, if it wasn't just my sight I lost that night, it was everything about me because it happened so suddenly and I didn't have time to prepare for it. Were you born uh, with no vision? No, I had, I had fantastic vision. Um, I wore glasses when, when I was in, in primary school. No, I, high school, I think, sorry, high school. Um, but my, my vision was very kind of stable all the way through. Absolutely no problem. A very, very kind of light prescription. Uh, just, just to kind of help me read more yeah. than anything else. Um, it was sight loss kind of very new to me. It wasn't on my radar, but during med school, like it was my final year of med school, I started getting headaches, couldn't concentrate on books. So kind of put it down to, you know, my script probably needs to change on, 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 my, on, my, on my glasses. I was being told that my script was absolutely fine. There's no issues at all. It's just the fact that I've got my head buried in a book in, in a yeah. littered <laughs> library. Um, but this kind of went on for a while. Uh, so I, I, I went down the private route to, to have it checked over and that's when I was diagnosed with a condition called keratoconus. And keratoconus is just a condition that the cornea kind of protrudes slightly out of your eye. So it, it stops the light from hitting the back of your retinas, um, giving you perfect vision. And a quick fix at that time was just to wear some glass lenses just to put the pressure back on the eye. And, and they worked for a good couple of years. I, I had absolutely no issues with them. Apart from it, they, they looked like mini, mini pasta bowls. They okay. were quite big. They were quite big. They looked like mini pasta bowls. You had to fill them up with saline solution mm. and then pop them into your eye without losing any of that saline solution. Otherwise, you get a bubble. Oh, wow. Um, so I would go through, when I first started wearing them, I would go through liters of this every week. Yeah. Um, but by the end of the day, you would see a tide line in my in my corner in my in my lenses because the fluid is slowly kind of drained out but you got used to that so that, that okay. was that was that was probably a way of saying Emmett you've had a long day now time to pop them out and relax got it okay and at what point did you start to see a difference with your eyes and when you thought I really need to get this sorted now yeah so it got to a, a, a few it was it was after I qualified as a, as a, as a doctor um so during your GP training you didn't did you I, no GP I, oh, I sorry so yeah so I I went down the emergency medicine Route. Oh, 
I am not so keen on sitting behind a desk. <laughs> <laughs> you ask my mum, I cannot sit still. Um, I need to be doing something all of the time. I don't like, I don't like a routine. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like to go to work and, it, oh, it's completely different today than it was yesterday. Um, and I like that. And I like to be, I like, I like, I like to kind of think on my feet. Mm -hmm. And I've always been good at that. So I kind of went down the whole um, emergency medicine route. So while I, while I was working, my, my, my sometimes my fix uh, when I had patients were a little bit uncomfortable mm. is to, to probably, I'll tap on my eyes because it was a glass lens on my eyes. I'm like, listen to this. And they're, they're like, Oh my God, I'm freaked out. But now, now, now you kind of, you're in my, you know, I'm, I'm in control of this conversation. Now. Yeah. You're listening to me now. Um, That's but, so funny. But uh, yeah, it was, it was a couple of years after I got, so graduated, qualified, mm -hmm. um, started noticing that the, the lenses just weren't sitting on my eyes correctly. They were kind of popping out. They weren't, they weren't giving me the, 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 the hours I really needed to, mm -hmm. to work with these lenses in there. So we we went down the corneal transplants and and corneal transplant is very much remove the cornea from your eye replace it with a donor cornea and stitch it up and the cornea is just that windscreen that that clear um piece in just in front of your eye a protective piece in front of your eye. so it's, it's it's quite a simple operation when it comes to transplants yeah um and it would be i would have the corneal transplant done and you'd only do it to one eye at a time just in case there was any issues so i would have well, I had the first eye done. Um, a couple of months later, I had the second eye done. Everything looked good mm. until there were signs of rejection. My eyes were starting to cloud over. I was getting um, lots of lots of pain kind of around my eyes. And every six to nine months, we would redo another corneal transplant. Oh um, until we got to the eighth one. And all this time, I was still working. So I would do a corneal transplant. Take three weeks off work, yeah. go back to work again. And by this time, I was I was the liaison officer for the MOD and the NHS. I was working in government. I was still working as a, as a trauma doctor. I was a rapid response uh, driver as well. So work was great. I was loving what I was doing. Just my, my vision sometimes kind of played a little hindrance on this. And I had to kind of take a step back, take a few weeks off, have a transplant, go back again. And then I was told that... I couldn't have more than eight corneal transplants because my body just could not take it. It was quite a lot to put mm. on your body. And you can imagine every time kind of cutting into your corneas and replacing it with another and stitching it around. So I had to have a backup plan. If this ever happened again, where do I go? Who do I talk to? And my backup plan was America. They were so far ahead of us in research, in, in the different types of meds that's come along with having a transplant, kind of bringing your immune system down and then bring it back up again. Uh, a lot more specialists out there. A lot more money was, was plowed into mm -hmm. keratoconus out in America. Um, and that time came. That, time, that, that ape transplant time came. And I remember going from the consultants back home, picking up my go bag, um, and on the way to the airport, calling my dad and saying, I'm off to the States. This day's coming. Mm. Um, and my dad said, well, I'm, at, I'm 24 hours behind you. And we were both in New York for six months finding the consultants, um, finding the right medication, talking to pharmaceutical companies. I had my corneas growing using my stem cells. But all this came at a huge cost. You know, it was, it was a quarter of a million pounds we spent in, in, in that time. Um, and it wasn't feasible for us to have the transplant out there because one, it was very expensive. And two, if it had failed... How do I fly back with, with, with eyes that I can't really get onto planes with? You know, just the air pressure would, would cause so much harm to it. So we brought everything across and had the transplant here in, in the UK and 2020 vision. My uh, it was, um, and in those two years, got back into a job I loved, <laughs> fell in love, got married, had the big Indian wedding. Um, <laughs> And life was good. Life was fantastic. I thought, I thought at, at this point in my life, it couldn't get any better. I've, I've married this amazing woman who I kind of instantly fell in love with. Um, and we're, we're talking about starting a family. We're talking about where we want to kind of see ourselves in the next five to 10 years. You know, when we have kids, where do we want our kids to grow up? All these really great conversations that you have kind of at that, at that start of, the, of, of, of after you get married. And I remember it was a, it was November time. So we got married in March and, and in November time, I was back and forth from work quite a lot, doing really long hours. Though me and, me and my wife lived in the same house. We didn't see each other because I would do night shifts and I would sleep in the spare room or we would make sure that, you know, she would never, she wouldn't disturb me if I, knowing that I've had a long double shift or something. And she said to me, Amit, 
we've got to have dinner together. And I'm like, Seema, I'm going to be really late from work. She said, no, 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 I'll stay up, I'll stay up. Um, and she, Seema knows. So the one thing Seema knows about me is if I've had a patient in, in the A&E who doesn't have anybody with them, who doesn't have any family, doesn't speak the language, feels alone, yeah. I would always go and make sure that they're okay if they've been... Um, if they're, if they're staying in the hospital, I'll make sure that they're comfortable and that they, they, they know they're not alone mm -hmm. and they could always reach out. And and obviously that day I had a patient like that. So I had I, I changed out my scrubs, got back into, into my clothes, went and had my dinner with a patient who spoke no English, had no family, um, sat there until they fell asleep and they, they, they knew that they're not on their own. Yeah. Um, got home really late. The Etsima still stayed up. We had dinner together. She went off to bed. Um, I stayed up for a few more hours to kind of just uh, watch a bit of TV, do some paperwork, went to bed. And what we didn't realize is there was pressure building up in the back of the eyes and the eyes literally went pop overnight. So I woke up in the morning. I, I felt absolutely nothing at all. My wife woke up to a bit of a horror show. What do you mean? The blood all over the pillow, blood all over my face. Um, my eye, you, you couldn't really see my eyes at all. Um, there was just so much blood just around the eyes, um, a little bit of bruising around the eyes. Oh, um, and how did you feel when you woke up? I, I, because I couldn't see the, I couldn't see exactly what had happened. I kind of, I obviously knew it. You know, this is this is this is quite serious. But I, I kind of thought, well, if it's if it's just the corneas or something that's just erupted, maybe it's just a simple fix. Um, because I didn't really have that much pain. The the, the it literally just went pop. And that was it. Um, Did you see anything? I could see it, it. To me, it looked like I was looking through a very dirty bit of glass. It was. It was. Okay. I I could make things out, just make little shadows out. But that was it. Um, another great example of me it's describing how it was, it was kind of like sinking to the bottom of the swimming pool as you're looking up, so you can see the light. Yeah. You can see kind of ripples. Yeah. But that's it. It kind of gets darker and darker as the as. As the minutes went on, it just got darker and darker and darker and darker and darker. And then for us, it was very much jump in the car, yeah. go to the hospital. Um, and they, the first thing they did is bandage the eyes up and said, look, we can't do anything for a couple of days. We have to let all of this kind of calm down. We'll open it up and then we'll have a look. Um, and those 48 hours were probably the worst 48 hours in my life. Uh, being a doctor was probably the worst thing. Because I, yeah. I kind of knew that in my head, I knew that the moment the bandages were removed, if it took the consultant more than five seconds to say anything, it's it's probably a bad thing because he's thinking about what to say and how to say it. Um, and if that mm, R starts, I'm like, OK, I know I do that because I'm, I'm in my head. I'm trying to think about what to say to the patient. All of these things. But then on the other side, I'm kind of thinking, well, it disappeared. You know, I lost my sight really quickly. Hopefully, it might be just a quick fix. Mm -hmm. It might just be a quick fix and we'll, we'll, we'll get it back again. Um, but it's hard to hold on to the positive stuff. Um, you kind of always think about the negative stuff. What's going to happen if I don't see? What happens if this is what my life is always going to be like? Is this, you know, and then the pain started coming up. Um, and then there's all these medications that you have to have for the inflammation and everything else. So then it make, means that you, your fingers become numb and you can't feel what you're doing. So now you can't see, but you can't feel, you can't stand up because you can't feel the fact that you're standing on the floor. Mm. Um, so that was, that was pretty tough. Um, but, you know, I, I, think, I think for me, it went from being... A, a quite loud household because I talk all the time. I'm, I, you, you know, I'm there. If I'm in the room, you know, I'm there. So being a very quiet because I didn't know what to say, so I didn't say anything at all. My wife is literally in shock, thinking, where, "Where do we need to go next? Who do I need to talk to?" You know, trying to arrange appointments and and everything else. And she's not in the medical field. She doesn't. This is not her thing. Um, and she's never been there for any of my corneal transplants, so she. She doesn't know what to expect or is this normal? Is this not normal? Is this a bit over the top to, to you know, a normal corneal transplant? Can we just do a corneal transplant? Will that fix it? All these things, all these questions she has, but I had no answer to any of it. Um, I can't imagine how you must have felt in that moment. But uh, it's... Uh, how did you manage those 48 hours? I didn't. I, I, I think it was very much... I, to me, I very much felt like I sat down on a seat and then what, stood up 48 hours later. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what I, what, I, what I was thinking. Um, it was it was just not to think about anything. It was um, 
try to stay positive was what everybody said. Mm. But that was the last thing I was thinking about. I was probably thinking about all the what ifs. Mm. If this is my life, what if? You know, we just got married. But, you know, we're talking about children. What if this is what my life is going to be like? Are we ever going to have children? Am I going to be happy again? And and those words you said about not just, it wasn't just my sight, it was everything, you know, my confidence, independence, am I having to rely on someone? This is a whole new thing to me. Um, I don't know anybody who's who's visually impaired, who's, who's close enough to, mm-hmm. I can call up and say, what do I do? Who do I turn to? What can I, you know, how can I move forward from this? Um, and... I think that's 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 really the heart. It's the uncertainty. Yeah. It was it was the uncertainty because I'm the one who normally has all the answers. I will find <laughs> that answer. I will I will I will go out and I will research. I will find those answers. I don't take no for an answer. Mm-hmm. You know, if if someone says you can't do this, well, why can't you do this? Mm-hmm. You know, why why can't it be done? Um, but not having you know, not even being able to stand up. Yeah. I I, I kind of felt. I, I I felt like I lost everything that day. Yeah can imagine i mean you just got married around six months prior right yeah and in within six months of being married when you're newlyweds you've just completely lost your sight and you have no answers of whether you're going to get it back or not so how do you go from there what what happened <laughs> after those 48 hours so it was it was back at the hospital mm-hmm. bandages came off it was a good in my head i'm one two three four and i'm still off thir- i'm still at 30 i'm at 40 i've got to a minute and then someone finally says something says oh i'm at I think it's worse than we thought. I'm not, in my head, I'm like, really? Uh, really? <laughs> you really? I'm, I'm like, come on, you've, yeah. you've hit the 60. Even I don't do the 60 second. <laughs> um, and then and it's the, the the tap on the on the shoulders, you know, that reassurance, you know, don't worry, I mean, we'll, we'll do what we can. But um, let's let's bandage this up and see you in three or four weeks. It was, wow. it was, it was, it was very much that. It was nobody could say what had happened because there was just so much going on, and okay. there was so much blood, so much bruising around the eye. Nobody could quite say this is what's happened. So it, it took a while for us to get a diagnosis to say this is actually what's happened to your eyes. Oh my gosh, um, that's the hardest part, though, because I guess, like you said, within those forty-eight hours, it's almost like we need to know what's happened. Okay, if you go back again, they said let's bandage it for three, four weeks. You're like, I can't wait. Yeah, that long again. In the in, in the three, four weeks, I. I when we left the hospital, I said to I said to see my wife. I said, "I think this is it. I think this is what it's going to be like." Um, it and she and she said, "Don't worry, we'll get we'll get through it." And she was always always the strong one. She's always, "Don't worry." You know, even though she all of this has just kind of come all at once, mm-hmm. she's like, "Don't worry, we'll get through it." You know, whatever happens, we'll get through it. So he's so emotional. <laughs> but she was work. She was working in London. We we're living in Guildford and Surrey. Mm-hmm. Um, and we both worked in in the city. I loved coming home every day. I loved seeing the the, the fields and the cows and the sheep as I'm yeah. driving home. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm home. You know, London's great. <laughs> yeah. But but working in any, you kind of see the bad parts of London sometimes. You, you yeah, awesome. a negative kind of vibes. You kind of get the rudeness of London. Yeah. You can see that. So it's nice to come home to the countryside. Oh, mm, do you know what I'm, yeah. home. Um, <laughs> I'm out of there. Yeah, exactly. And when Seema took a couple of weeks off work, she was she got a couple of weeks off. So it's she was in the house trying to it it's it's weird because i was in a house that i was familiar with mm-hmm. but i couldn't feel the the handrail i couldn't feel anything if i held anything i can if so if my wife gave me a cup in my hand i couldn't feel the fact that i'm holding it because my fingers were numb due to the medication um so all, oh so gosh. it was very so my wife had to hold a, a cup in front of me with a straw um and 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 i'm thinking wow it's gone from being being a trauma doctor, flying around the world for major incidences, to now my wife having to hold a cup with a straw in it because I can't physically hold the cup, and I can't get down the stairs. It's that why why do I why, when I wake up in the morning I can't do anything, so I'm I'm kind of in my bed all day long, and then it got to a point where my wife had to go to work. You know she had she she's got a job we've got a mortgage pay she had to go to work. Yeah, she would go to work, and every day my my little wins were can I get out of my bed and make it to the bathroom. And that's that to me was a win. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to get back from the bathroom back to the bed again. Literally, my wife would come home from work and help me back into the bed because that was all my energy just, just gone. It would take me hours. Not even, it would take me half a day to get from my bed to the bathroom. And this is a house I'm familiar with. So when you can't feel anything and you can't see anything, it, you know, there's a lot of 
bashing your head, you don't feel you're bashing your head or you're, you're I'm crawling on the floor. You can't tell you're crawling on the floor. I fell down the stairs a few times because I didn't realize I was so close to the landing. And it, the, the day changed, the, the, everything kind of changed one day when it, this was a couple of, this was about a month after I'd lost my sight. I started getting a little bit of sensation back in my fingers, but not, nothing completely. Um, and I wanted to make a cup of tea. And this is the first time I've made a cup of tea after, since losing my sight. I kind of put the kettle on, I put my fingers in the cup, poured the water in because I don't know how far to fill the cup up. My fingers are being burnt, but I can't feel it. And then the water spills over the top. And then I realize what's happened. I drop the cup, water everywhere, burn myself. And then I thought I cleared up all the broken glass. What I didn't realize is there's glass embedded in my hands. And my wife came home again to blood everywhere. And she's like, no, we're not doing this. We are. And then she sat me down and said, damn it, if we move to London, we can probably get the help you need. And I could be there. I could, we can be, I can be from, you know, we can find somewhere close to work and we, I can be there for you. And, and she said to me, she said to me, if you could probably navigate London as a blind person, you could probably navigate the world. Yeah. And it made no <laughs> sense to me whatsoever. I'm like, don't you? No, no way. But she said it and she had to have so much strength to say that because she knew it would be very negative to me when she yeah. said that, you know, t- telling me I've just lost my sight. Now let's go into a really busy kind of yeah. urban area and, and, and try and navigate. But she said it and she, and I know I know with Seema that when she says something, she's, it's because she's thought about it for so long. She's got her game plan in her head. Yeah. She's, she's one of those people who... If I say let's let's go on holiday, she's she's got this little plan going. With me, it's like let's go on holiday. Here's the passports. Let's go. Kind yeah, of thing, right. It's, it's we're very 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 different. Um, she she thinks about everything. She's got her backup plan. She's got all these things. So I know when she said that that she's got a plan in her head. And by this time, she'd already found out you know which local authorities give the best services to visually impaired people because mm-hmm. it's a it's a lottery depending on where you live on how much help you get um she's already kind of looked at what areas we we would mo- need to move into for her to be close to work okay. all of these she's done all of this while going back and forth to work and thinking about me and looking after me and working full time all of this stuff so I'm thinking okay this this is probably a good thing but I, but the turning point for me was this, when I lost my sight. I didn't want to tell anybody just how much it hurt, you know, physically and mentally. When my parents came around, I didn't want to cry in front of them. I didn't want to say, Dad, this, this, this really hurts, you know. I would, I would go away, go into the next room, have a cry, come back and think, oh, nobody's realised. But I've got, yeah. I've got tears of blood coming down my face. It's obvious I've just had a little cry and come back. And one day I was sat with my dad. And he, and he tried, to, tried to kind of get me to talk. We were just talking about things. And then I just suddenly burst into tears. And I said, I said, Dad... Why has this happened to me? What have I done so wrong in my life that I'm going through all of this? And he stood up and he put his arms around me. And he said, Amit, everything you have in life, you've worked for. I've never given you anything. Me and your mum have never given you anything. But we've always been there to help you back up again and support you. And they said, look, you know, you, you, you did a career that you loved. You fell into it by yourself. There was no pressure of being a doctor. You know, but the whole Asian <laughs> thing, there was no pressure at all of going and being a doctor. It just happened that that's what I pursued. Um, you know, you fell in love, you got married, you, you know, you, you, you found this amazing girl of your dreams. And now this is just another hurdle you need to get over. And remember, we'll be here for you, but we can't do the hard work for you. And that to me really sunk in because my dad could have said that to me on day one, day two, day three. But he knew he had to pick the right moment to say this to me. Because if it if he said it first on the first day, it would mean nothing. Yeah. He had to pick that time where I was so vulnerable that I would actually listen. And he picked the right day. And he said to me a few years later, I it was the hardest thing he's ever had to do is yeah. hold that back. Hold that kind of pep talk back yeah. for when he really needed it. He said, that was the only thing I had. He said, that's the only thing I had. And I had to hold it back. Me and your mum discussed when we're going to say it to you and all of this <laughs> stuff. And it just happened. It ha- came out on that day. Um but yeah, it was, and then kind of looking back, I'm like, well, if this is what my life is, if this is what my life is going to be like, one, I'm going to work through the pain. Two, I'm going to, I want to hold my head up high again, yeah. you know? And it's, I felt, in a weird way, I felt ashamed losing my sight. I felt like I, I, I promised my wife everything yeah, and then couldn't deliver, you know? It was, it was that whole, am I ever going to do or provide or, or be part of that community again you know be part yeah. of that you know have respect yeah you know um and even though it's weird being being an asian you get these all these comments that my wife was you know my wife would get oh well, you married a you married a doctor but now he's blind you're gonna have to look after him for the rest of your life 
Simon's like, no, 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 I married Amit. He's in there somewhere when he's ready. And these are people we don't know. People who yeah. kind of want to give their little bit. I'm like, go on, I don't want to hear this. Yeah. You, you're, you're at the temple and people are like, oh, poor you, poor you. I'm like, what do you mean poor me? I'm, yeah. I'm okay. I'm, I'm doing all right, you know. Um, but it's all these negative comments that, oh, because you've got a disability now, you might as well just stay at home and let people look after you. And I didn't want that. So I was yeah. very much, I've never sat at home. I think, I think <laughs> all that time I was... I, I lost my sight. It was the longest time I've ever been in the home, yeah. you know, in that, in, in that, in that time. Um, so for me, it was more of a, a journey, more of a, a battle to get kind of back on my feet again and to prove that, do you know what? Having sight loss isn't going to stop me. But that's when you start coming against all these kind of hurdles. Yeah. You know, if it's, if it's, you know, uh, local authorities saying, well, I'm it. okay, you know, we can help you with, with learning a white cane, living independently again. But there's... Um, is a six-month waiting list. There's so many things I want to unpack there, but I think one of the key things I speak about in this podcast is mental health mm -hmm. and the coping strategies of dealing with difficult situations. Because look, what you went through happened to you immediately and you had to be in this fight or flight mode, right? Like you said, your dad gave you that piece of advice, but I'm sure it wasn't just that one piece of advice when you broke down that allowed you to overcome those emotions, process them, and then deal with them. So talk me through that journey because I'm sure there's people at home who are going through a difficult time or they have been through a difficult time and they're thinking at the moment, I'm not going to make it the other side. I want to give up. I'm done with this. You know, I, I, I'm so unhappy right now Yeah. and I don't see the other side. Yeah, no, I can completely relate to that. It was, um, for such a long time, it was, why am I waking up in the morning? What, what am I doing all day? Um, it was, it was, can I... It, it, you know, in, in in my head, it was it was kind of playing the scenarios off. If I can't adapt, what happens to me? What happens to Seema? Yeah. If I, it, also, the, if Seema walked away, I wouldn't blame her. It was it was it was that I, you know all this all this pressure I kind of put on her. That if you know, did you ask her that question? I we we've spoken about it afterwards, um, and she she and, and I and I think I'm very lucky in the fact that Seema can read me really well you know it's we we they didn't know each other a few, a few years before we got married right but in those few years she she kind of she knew what every facial expression meant you know every <laughs> hand gesture meant she knew she knew that if i started tugging on the back of my hair it's because my eyes were hurting and this was all prior to my corneal transplants or a bit before my big you know before losing my sight and stuff she she picked up on all these little things um and she she also knew that I always had an answer to everything. You know, there's always always a solution that I you know. And we we had this discussion right at the beginning. I said to him, I said, if you're going to marry me for the money and the and the house and the car, I said you've got the wrong person. Yeah. I said I'm not in it for the money or the house or the car. Yeah. I was brought up with my parents saying you look after people around you. You make sure everybody else is okay. You know, I I went and did six months in India with the Red Cross. Came back with absolutely nothing at all, to the point where I had no raise or anything i had a beard which was like huge and my brother's like i mean you go to the bathroom now at the at the airport and have a shave because i'm not taking you in my car like that so, so but it's not it's never been i was brought up with as long as if you can help someone you help them yeah. you know it's not about the wealth or anything at all it's about being happy in life and i'm very very lucky i've got two amazing parents who installed that in, uh, into us right from day one yeah so it's, it's about the caring it's about giving back it's about if you can do it you do it yeah right? you don't think about it you know well, we can go without if someone else needs it absolutely mm -hmm. fine and i'm lucky that she was on board with that because she could have easily walked away you know anybody could walk away but she was like no that that's that's how i feel yeah and i think when when i lost my sight it was is she really going to cope? Is she going to be able to embrace the fact that she's got a blind husband now? And all these comments, all these negative comments, you know, people saying that I'm not worth anything, I can't do anything, that she's going to have to look after me. That, that broke me up inside because I'm thinking, well, I hope she doesn't believe that because I want to get back yeah. on my feet again. You know, um, and then it's finding the help and the resources and, and you know, oh, it's a six month wait before we can come out and help you. Um, it's, well, how do I find the answers? I, I can't, open a laptop anymore i can't see what i'm doing i can't pick up a phone i can't dial um she would have to do all of this for me and she did she 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 did all of this but there was i remember there was one one time where i woke up one morning and 
I thought I'd, I'd woken up and, my, and, my, and Seema said to me, Emma, you know you haven't slept for like three days. You've kind of been in this little trance. You haven't slept for three days. You've just been sat there. Um, so I was prescribed some sleeping tablets. I, I took a couple and I thought I took, I, I fell asleep. I thought I fell asleep. I took some more afterwards and uh, it had only been 24 hours and I hadn't fallen asleep and I'd taken the whole packet. Uh, and I realized what I did and I said to see my, I need to go to the doctors and um, went to the hospital and they said, oh, are you trying to take your life? And I said, no, I'm just trying to sleep. I'm trying to switch off all these negative thoughts in my head for 10 minutes. Yeah. That's all I want to do is is not hear anything in my head. And I'm like, no, 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 you, you're, you're suicidal. I'm like, I'm not suicidal. I just, I'm telling you now, I want to live life, but I just want everything just to switch off for 10 minutes. I want to fall asleep. I want to go to sleep is all I want to do. Um, and this is the problem. And this is the problem. Everyone's it's... telling you something negative, And when you don't believe it, they're saying, oh, you must do though. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so we had to fight to get the help. And I'm like, well, and they're like, have you spoken to anybody? I said, no, because there's a year waiting list to speak to someone. Um, and then I can have to play the card. Well, I'm not sure where I'm going to be in a year's time. Being a doctor, mm. you kind of know what to say and what <laughs> triggers things. Um, so I'm like, well, I'm not sure where I'm going to be in a year's time. In my head, I'm like, I'm going to be in London is what I thought, right? But it just came they out. They don't need to know that. They don't need to know that. I'm not sure where I'm going to be. And they're like, well, I think you need to talk to someone, don't you? I'm like, yes, please. Yeah. The person I spoke to, their parents were visually impaired. It just happened to be uh, wow. uh, the, the counsellor I was speaking to, uh, her parents were visually impaired, and she poured some some life back into me. Yeah. And so I said, damn it, my parents are this, but look what I've done. Don't worry about, you know, you, you need help, and that's mm-hmm. absolutely fine to ask for it. But do you know what? My parents get through life every day, and there's two of them. Um, and I've grown up to be this, you know, to do a career that I love. My parents haven't held me back. All of these things, yeah. things that you need to hear, yeah. things that, you know, the positive stuff. Um, and that, and you know, with, with my dad saying what he did and Seema saying, well, we need to, let's move to London. Let's get the help you needed, need and all of this stuff. The moment we got into London, it was get, get to the local authorities, right? So, you know, we've just moved in. We've just bought a house. We've sold up in Guildford. We bought a house in London, um, got in touch with the local authorities. We're, we're now registered with the local authorities within, within a few weeks. We we're getting the help that I needed. Mm-hmm. I was very, very lucky that the lady who was teaching me my, my white cane training was also a brow teacher. Wow. Uh, and she said to me, she looked at my history and kind of said, well, you kind of need to occupy yourself, don't you, Emmett? Because I'm, I'm rattling around in the house all day, not doing anything, walking around with a white cane, kind of practicing. Um, and she's like, well, let's let's do some brow. It'll keep your mind occupied as well. Mm-hmm. To the point where she'll give me exercises to do. And Seema wouldn't give me dinner in the evening if I didn't complete the exercise. <laughs> to me, food is a great motivation. Yeah, me so, too. And she knows that. She knows, yeah. So it's like, come on, Emmett, you can just finish this one off. And then you could eat. I'm like, Come on, Zima. Yeah. Um, but but you know she would she would do a full day at work, and then she would take me out with my white cane and come on, Amit. Let's give you a little bit more confidence. Let's do this. And mm-hmm. she she took on so much more, yeah. which nobody else saw because now it's just the two of us. Yeah. You know, people are like, oh, poor you, Amit. Poor you. Nobody's ever thinking about how Seema coping. You know, all these all these issues that I'm going through, it's double for her because she's trying to hold me together and hold herself together and, and, and be strong for the two of us. And nobody talks about that. Did um, any did at any point it really be detrimental to your relationship? Were there any days where you both were like, This is so hard. We can't do this. Never. Not we can't do this, no, I guess. It was the know. it was the opposite. Wow. It was the opposite. Every single day I would fall asleep with arms around me. She would always remind me that we're here together. We're, we're doing it as a team. She signed up, you know, for life. And it's not it's not for anything else. It's it's we are doing this together. Um, and it doesn't matter what we're doing, as long as we're doing it together. Um and she and she said to me, I know you're gonna push yourself too much. Don't. She she said it right. She said, Don't, we'll take every step as it comes. We'll find the help, we'll find this, you know, find the solutions. But nobody sees, you know, I know. And I, I hear a voice and I can hear that softness in her voice. I can hear that genuine, you know, that feeling in her voice. But then she will go away and have a cry because she knows it's so hard for her. She will, she will go to her friends and she, she, you know, she's very lucky to have some amazing friends that she could go to and say, look, you know, it's, it's been a hard day. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I should be able to talk to them because with me, in a weird way, when I lost my sight, people weren't sure how to talk to me. So they didn't talk to me at all. 
and they just moved away. They t- turned off. The, the friends you thought were there for life stopped calling. The ones you thought were, you know, your, your acquaintances, the people you kind of just, the ones who pick up the phone and say, Emmett, how are you doing today? And you're like, well, you don't really know me, but you've made the effort, yeah. you know. You soon, find, my life was, I, the one thing I didn't realise when I lost my sight is just how lonely it could be, right? Not, not seeing anything in front of you. Um, you could be in a room full of 100 people, but they have to come to you. You can't go to them. You can hear their voices. They can walk straight past you, but it's lonely. Mm. And that that's the one thing I was never prepared for is the loneliness. I've never been alone in my I don't ever feel I've ever been alone in my life. Um, but that was the hardest thing to get over is just how isolated you feel, how vulnerable you feel. Um, you know, it, it used to just just to go out to the shops and buy some milk it used to take me two or three days to mentally prepare myself to leave my house with my white cane. And then come back and then I wouldn't not be out of energy for, for weeks. Oh, um, all of these things that doesn't have to be as hard. But then you know, it's the way people talk to you when you're out and about. Mm. People push you, barge you. Um, I've had my white cane taken out of my hand because I've accidentally tapped someone's trainer as I'm walking along the um, um, railway station. Um, I've had children spin me in a circle on the underground say, now find your way. No. Um, I've had... I've, I've been mugged I've, I've i've been pushed i've been barged and then people laugh all, all that whole thing where people tense their shoulder and just as they walk up to you just give you an elbow and you're like wow you're joking and you think to yourself it doesn't have to be this hard and then when you talk about it you get some people who who come out on social media and say well why are you making this a big thing it's happened you know i've been blind all my life and it happens just get used to it oh i'm like i don't God. want to get used to it why should you what, get what, used to and, it and, and the one thing i used to get all the time is stop rocking the boat Amit. stop rocking the boat stop stop talking about all these negative th- i'm like well i don't want to leave my house uh, but what used to fuel me is the messages that people used to send me Amit, this happens to me all the time i don't i don't have the courage to talk about it I don't leave my house anymore. Or I don't do this anymore. I've changed my routes to work and it's become harder. Mm. Or I don't go on the train. I don't go on the tube. And it's good that you're talking about it. Um, but I talk about it. But I talk about it with emotion because I come home and I cry about it as well. Of course. Because, um, yeah, and it's uh, life is... But I mm. say that, but I've met some amazing people on my yeah. sight loss journey. Some really amazing people on my site. People who have put their sh- arm on my shoulder and said, I'm it. I'm here for you. And yeah. do you know what? I can genuinely understand what you're going through because I've had people who say, oh, well, I can imagine what you're going through because I can close my eyes. I'm like, yeah, but you can open them again. Uh, you can open your eyes after two minutes and carry on with your life. But my life is very much in this darkness every day. But I want to be the best that I could be. I want to do everything. I, do. I, want, to, I want to have my dreams, my ambitions. I want to, you know, I want to smile again. Yeah. And I think that was it. I, I went from being a smiley, happy young man to not knowing how to smile. Yeah. And then I used to smile for people around me, not because I was happy, but because it made them feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, I used to spend so much energy in making sure that I I looked presentable or I, I was happy and, you know, I didn't give away that my eyes hurt all the time like they do. My eyes hurt 24 hours a day. I feel like someone's uh, rubbing chili powder in my eyes constantly. Nobody knows that. Yeah. Um, so but why now, would you need still to? Still now that happens. Still now. Still now, wow. um, so it's uh, it got you know it you you deal with you know you deal with the pain mm-hmm. yeah then you then you you try to make everybody comfortable mm. around ar- but then you have got no other energy you've got no resources to tap into to carry on your day yeah um, it was only after kind of being in a room full of visually impaired people and talking to people and it's like do you know what I don't have to pretend. To to be great every day. Yeah. You know what, you get your good day and your bad day. And I talk about that on social media. You know, you, it's, my life is not on Instagram. I do not have, I do not have days to do that one photo. Mm-hmm. But it, you know what, I, I probably have five minutes if that. Yeah. Like, um, but, but it's not that. I talk about the good stuff, or the, talk about the bad stuff, I talk about everything in between mm-hmm. because that's life. Cool. That is very much life. And then this journey I've been on, I've, I'm, I've met some amazing people who've helped me and kind of, got me to where I am, people mm-hmm. who believe in me, people mm-hmm. who turn around and said, well, actually, I'm it. you can't do this. Why can't you do yeah. this? Let's find a solution on doing it. 
and that's what we need. It's it's not looking at someone's disability. It's looking at their abilities, right? It's, it's, it's not focusing on the negative stuff. It's focusing on what they're good at. And how can we enrich your life? And do you know what? Do you want to smile again? Let's make you smile again. Let's go and find whatever it is that you need in life to, to be happy again. I really love that you've just said that because one of the things that recently I've had to remind myself of is don't let other people's limiting beliefs be <laughs> your limiting beliefs, right? Yeah. So everyone yeah. has limiting beliefs within themselves but I'm not going to let your limiting beliefs be mine because you can say I can't do something you will tell me that I'm not able to do something you will say that it's impossible but that's only because it's impossible for you not because it's impossible for me yes and I think it's so important that we remind ourselves that if someone is telling us that we can't do something it's because they can't do it not because we can't do it I completely agree it's it's sometimes people see me and I'll say, oh, okay, he's blind. He can't. He can't obviously do this. Um, I get, I get, I get people, strangers who come up to me and say, oh, I've, I've, I've read your book. It's really good. Or I've seen you on TV. That was really good. But I think you're really selfish for having kids. I get that all the time. People it's, have said you're selfish for having having children. children. Yep, you have, you're selfish for having. Does it give you more benefits? Is another is is the follow on. Um, it's and then you go. Well, what do you mean? And we go. Oh, you're not going to see the same. Up, you know, we're not going to have the same upbringing, or we're not going to. You know, if they're, if they're ever in trouble, how are you going to see it? I when I found out that I was going to be a dad, what I never thought I would be a dad after I lost my sight. So my life kind of went from being great to to kind of hitting rock bottom, and then kind of that that journey of of kind of finding myself again. Yeah. And in that in that time of finding myself, me and my wife got stronger. To the point where we talk about everything. Yeah. Right. We 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 thought we had a strong relationship when we got married. Yeah. It's like supersonic now. It's 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 incredible. We are we are very very strong together, and that that kind of reflected. So when we kind of found out what we we're expecting, we we're like, wow, okay. And I said to, I said to my wife, I said, I said, Seema, I don't, I, you know, my sight loss isn't going to stop me, you know, from being the best dad that I could be. You know, I want to be. I want to. I want to do everything every 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 other parent does but we'll find a way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Her reply was, Amit, don't you ever think your sight loss is ever going to stop you from changing a nappy? <laughs> right, that's, that's what, and, and I love that because she doesn't see me as her as her blind husband. She sees me as her husband and mm -hmm. now she, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the father of our children and all these. She doesn't see the blindness because yeah. we it's, it's our every day. Yeah. We know how to, it's other people who get uncomfortable about it where we know what we're doing. Other people are, oh no, he, he, he definitely can't do this. Or I remember when my, my child was born, we, we used to go to the library, to, the, to, to all these little clubs, music clubs, all this, mm -hmm. you, you know, two, three months old. And the parents would, would avoid me and my son because they wouldn't know how to interact with us. To the point where I'd walk, I'd come home and I'm like, see, I didn't speak to anybody. You know, Ab Abby didn't get to play with anybody. Um, because the parents just don't know how to talk to me. So we'd go to the park instead. And then he could be on the swings. And then you hear parents saying, oh, I, you know, I wonder how, who, how, you know, how he's looking after the kid. I wonder, you know, if something happened to the kid, I wonder how he, how he's going to cope. I'm like, I can hear you. You're literally two feet away. I can hear you talking about me. Um, and the worst one was when I went, it was the first day my son was starting um, nursery, chest harness. My wife knew it, it meant it was going to mean a lot to me if I did the first job. I'm walking down the street, chest harness, Kika in a harness, um, singing nursery rhymes, a lot of big yeah. grin on my face because this is, you know what? I'm happy. I'm yeah. genuinely happy, popping away. I don't care if anybody sees me or hears me. I'm, I'm enjoying life. Get to, get to nursery and hand, hand my son across, take the chest harness off, hand all that across, and a little tap on my shoulder. And there was a parent who said, well done you. And I'm like, what for? And they're like, you brought your son to the nursery. I'm like, I'm, I hope you brought your child to yeah. nursery. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but I'm not blind. Oh. And I'm like, wow. So you, from all of this, you just saw the dark glasses and, yeah. and, and, and yeah. Kika. Yeah. Um, I said, I, I went home and I'm like, do we have to prove ourselves as yeah. parents? And seems like, no. I'm like, well, apparently society thinks we do have to prove ourselves as parents. Um, and seems like, well, you just take on all the parenting then, Emma. Yeah. Come with it. There you go. But yeah, but do you know what? It, it kind of felt like it felt like people were watching and judging yeah. and waiting for you to make a mistake. Yeah. Um, but do you know what? We haven't. I don't think we made any any major mistake. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's uh, you just find a way of doing it. But again, it's 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 talking to you know other other people who are who've got kids who've got visual impairments and all this mm -hmm. and having that network yeah. and saying, well, do you know what? This is new to me. 
is there a, I mean, like, well, I meant, you know what? It's just trial and error. Yeah. Things work for me. Things work for this person. Doesn't work for everybody. And that's what it was. It was a trial and error. Um, but yeah, best days of my life. Something you said to me earlier was people are always constantly feeling sorry for you. <laughs> and it's so frustrating <laughs> because you don't feel sorry for yourself. And this is what I was talking about previously is it's very hard to run through emotions when other people are putting so many emotions on you. Does that make sense? It does. It How does. do you cope with all of the negative comments, all of the constant, you know, ahs and all, oh, you know. Do you know what? Sometimes I just want to ignore them. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I just kind of keep walking and don't, don't, don't say anything at all. Don't, don't, don't react. Sometimes I just kind of want to turn around and say, oh, why do you think my life is so bad? You know, I, I've, I've never been this happy in my life. I'm, I'm smiling. I'm enjoying life. But you think something's missing. You're like, mm. yeah, but your sight, you know. And I'm like, but I've, I've dealt with that. I'm yeah. comfortable. Yeah, you know, the only thing, the only thing I think I was very sad about when, when we're finding out that when we found out what we were expecting is, am I going to know what my kid, my child looks like? What? Yeah. Um, and that, that was in the forefront of Seema's thoughts as well. She knew that was always going to niggle mm-hmm. in the back of my head. You know, there'll always be that kind of. But I'll never know what my son looks like. Never know what my son looks like. The moment Abhishek was born. My wife, first thing she did is give me this amazing audio description of what he looked like. She's like, I'm put your hand here, do this, feel this, all this. Oh. We, And she did this every single morning, afternoon, evening for a whole year. Now, my kids will say to me, they'll come, I've got two children, I've got, I've got a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. They'll come over to me sometimes and even, Dad, feel my nose. It's got a little bit bigger than you felt it last time. <laughs> yeah. Because it, it's, it's, or do you know what? My ears are kind of looking like middle uh-huh. gaga's ears. Oh. You know, it's, 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 it's these kind of things. And they're describing themselves to me and they, they, to them, I'm not a blind dad, right? Yeah. So when we're out with my kids and, 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 it's, and it always happens, it's, the negativity always happens when you're in a, you're at a wedding or you're a big, big do and you've got lots of aunties and uncles you've never, haven't seen never for years. Before, yeah. or never met Oh, poor you, poor you. And it's like, we're, well, I'm here to celebrate a wedding, you know, yeah. and I'm, I'm really joy. And, you know, look at my two kids. Are yeah. they amazing? Yeah, I'm yeah, amazing yeah. Wife. <laughs> I'm like, why, you, why do you think? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not worthy to be so happy. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, but, you know, it's such a crucial thing, isn't it, sight? I'm like, well, I've, I had it, which I'm very thankful for. Mm-hmm. But it's gone and we move on, don't we? If we don't, what do I do? But yeah. like you could sit at home, man. I'm like, that's not me. You obviously don't know me. But why is it that that's all time? I find this really strange when people say, well, you're not worthy of happiness or, you know, you could sit at home. Yeah. Because you mentioned offline, people constantly ask you about benefits. You actually mentioned it at the start yes. of this. And if people are constantly bashing you for going out and doing something, we're going to talk around all of your active that's work in a minute. But... I just don't understand. It doesn't make any sense to me. But w- one thing I want, do want to talk around is Kika. So Kika is your very beautiful dog here that everyone can see. She is, she is the blonde leading the blind. Yeah. And what really stood out to me when I was reading your story was an incident where you said you were just not happy about getting a dog. You were against getting a dog. <laughs> yes. You didn't want yes. one. But it's, in an instant, she changed your mind. So can you tell everyone a little I, bit I, about I, that? I can. It's, it's this misconception that's if you turn blind, that you get a guide dog. It's very, very the opposite to that. Okay. For me, guide dog wasn't even in my right. The only time I remember I could think about guide dogs was when I had a patient who used to walk, maybe come into a hospital with a guide dog. Um, those little cute doggy charity boxes you used to put your yeah. money into. <laughs> so, but guide dogs wasn't even a thought. It, w- it wasn't a conversation that me and my wife ever had. It was that when we were, so when I did my white cane training and I got better and better and got the confidence, I started volunteering for charities because my way of thinking was there's a lot of issues that vision impaired people have. There's a lot of things that charities need to do better on. The only way I could kind of help is get involved with the charities and change the way they do things or change people's mindsets or work with local um, governments to to make sure that there's funding and all these. Mm-hmm. So this, you know, having the background in medicine, I kind of had that. Then obviously having the, the the lived experience. Yeah. I know what works and what doesn't work and what's missing. Um, and guide dogs wasn't really anything on my, on, my, on my radar. But when I was doing my, the more I was kind of navigating my way around London, I, I had lunch with my white cane instructor. And she's like, I mean, you're doing so well. You know, it's, it's nice to win when someone who's taught you all of this, you can go back and say, thank you. Yeah. You have made my life yeah. so much better. So we're, we're, we're having lunch. And she said, Emmett, have you ever thought about a guide dog? And, and, and I said, Paulie, I said, 
I said, I could barely think, look after myself, let alone a guide dog. And she said, no, no, no. You know, there's a, there's a couple of, there's a couple of staff at the guide dog center that I think you should meet and have, a, you know, have a coffee with, and maybe you can go down that route. I'm like, do you know what? Probably not, not the right time yet. Um, and then I'm out with her about six months later. And she again said, oh, I'm having lunch with this, my, this gentleman from guide dog. She should have, you know, come and have lunch with her. I'm like, eh, not really. But I went home and that day I actually spoke, because I said to him, oh, I said, I said, Pauline was talking about guide dogs. And she said, yeah, I mean, you know, it could be something that might work for you. But yet we, we weren't in this world. We had no idea how it worked. So Seema said to me, she said, what about if I volunteer for guide dogs? Get my foot in the door. Yeah. And I kind of suss the organization out because we don't know what we're going to be signing up for. We've never, you know, never, never gone down that route ever. So she started volunteering for guide dogs. She started volunteering for guide dogs to... Um, and they had an office at Houston, just by Houston Station. And I was actually one day I was at the RNIB um, offices um, on Judge Street, just okay. just about a, a five minute walk down the road. And she gave me a call and she said, Amit, I'm at the offices at Guide Dogs. Why don't you walk along Houston Road, come into the office and meet the team? And I said, all right. So I'm walking along Houston Road, a simple road. But there's a few crossings that don't have um, Pelican crossings or they're not manned or anything at all. So it's quite hard to walk across. So for a sighted person, it's a five minute walk. Mm hmm. For me, it took me just an hour to wow. do that walk. Um, got to the offices. We went in and there was this big gentleman who came, kind of came over to me and he put his arms around me. And his name was Dave Kent. And he was the engagement officer for guide dogs. And he said, he turned to my wife and he said, Seema, don't worry about Amit. I'll look after him. But how are you doing? This was the first time ever someone had asked my wife how she was doing over me. And I thought to myself, I need this per this person in my life. Yeah. And we... We just got talking and he is, he is the most amazing person I've ever met. He's been visually impaired all his life. He's he's had 10 guide dogs. He works for the charity. He used to work for BBC. Um, very, you know, when it comes to education about disability and rights and campaigning, he was the guy to go to. Um, and just kind of being in the charity and having people like that work for the charity, I thought, well, do you know what? It's not just staff who work there, but it's people who care. People who also have start, um, sight impairments who work there. And I'm like, I kind of need these people in my life. Mm. So we went down the guide dog routes. We went to, um, we had, we have this assessment. To, they come to your house. They see, you know, what, how much sight you have originally. You know, it's it's because sight loss is such a spectrum. Um, they look at where you work, what you do, how far you go out to work every day, what your routines are like, who you live with, where you live. All of these things are taken into consideration. And then you're put onto this database. Right. And then after three months, I was, I was told, I'm at, you're on the on the database now. All we have to do is match a dog to to you to your requirements, and they said it could take up to four years. Wow! And I said, I turned around and said, "Thank goodness, because I couldn't do a dog right now." Because uh, and by this time we we just moved into we just bought a we bought an apartment in Canary Wharf. Okay. Um. So I know how to get back home. Yeah. Um. And I, and over coffee I, the next day, I said to my, I said to my wife, "Look, we're on the list now." I said it could take up to four years. How about we sell our apartment and buy a house with a garden? Because if we do get a dog, it'll be nice to have a garden. She's like, Amit, you could just get back yeah. to this flat. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but if in these four years, I can learn to get back to our new house when we get one, all of this stuff. So we put our we put, we put the flat on the market. A few weeks later, we get a phone call on a, on a Monday, Tuesday from the estate agency. Amit, we've sold it. I'm like, fantastic. A day later, we get a call from guide dog saying, Amit, we think we found you a guide dog. Her name is Kika. She's a yellow lab. She's naughty and she doesn't like everybody. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, we're going to bring her around in a week's time. And if she likes you, we can try your training. Together. If she doesn't, we might retire her before she's even become a guide dog. Uh -huh. So Kika was born the same month I lost my sight. So she was learned to be a guide dog as I was learned to be a blind guy. Um, and she was the naughtiest pup in training. She's the most stubborn tr in training, and they like to, like they like to match, you know, people with their dog. So I'm kind of thinking, okay, I'm stubborn, I'm <laughs> I'm a bit naughty, I'm a bit, bit headstrong. Yeah. All of these things are kind of damn it, it, it's just describing me. This is yeah. what I'm just describing me. Um, and Kika was named at birth, so she's she's there's no other Kikas in guide dog. It's, she's the only one, and it happens to be my mother-in-law's maiden name. You're joking. So from all the guide dogs. That are coming out of the system, Kika, who was born the same month I lost my sight with the wow. same family name. So my wife's cousins on her mum's side are all Kikas. 
Oh my gosh. Oh, so when I called my mother in law and said, I think they found me a dog called Kiko, they're like, don't take the mick out of me. I'm, I, I love taking the mick out of my mother in law. What? That's the joy of life, yeah. right? <laughs> I, I, I'm always thinking about the next trick. Um, but um, yeah, she's like, no, 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 it's a family name. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm sure they said Kika. Mm. But in that week, I could not sleep because I knew that in a week's time, they're going to bring this 18 month old puppy into the, into the, into the house. Um, and it'll be make or break whether she'll like us. And I wasn't mentally prepared. I thought I had four years. Um, so we're, we're packing up to leave this apartment when we, and then we've got the whole training. Um, but a week later, they, they bring Kika in. There was two, two instructors who came with her and they said, look, I mean, she might just make for the door. Yeah. And, if, and it's pretty clear. I'm like, fine, it's, you know, and, and, I, and me and my wife were, we're going to fall in love with this dog, aren't we? And she's like, yeah. And the dog's not going to love us, aren't we? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but we, we walked in. She, Kika walked in. She, she explored every single room in the, in the apartment and then went and sat in the sunny spots in the living room and fell asleep. And I'm like, I'm like it seems like she's sleeping. I'm like, Seema, just give her a bit of a kick. Give her a nudge. Give her, yeah. Do something because this is awkward now. Yeah. 20 minutes later, we've finished cakes. We've finished biscuits. We're on our second cup of tea. I'm like, Seema, just, just, and I, and I, and I, I think I, I walk, I got up and I kind of stumbled yeah. into Kika. Yeah. And she woke up and oh, and they're like, all right, let's, let's put the harness on. Yeah. And go for a walk. Now, the only other time I put a harness on, a, on and, and done a practice walk is with a guide dog instructor holding the harness walking around Canary Wharf and I had to pretend that person was a dog. So I'm walking around Canary Wharf at lunchtime in the busy kind of, you know, where everybody is. Everybody's kind of out for lunch. I'm walking around with a guide dog instructor holding a harness and I'm saying, well done, well done, uh, good girl, well done. I'm like, oh, da. it's lucky I can't see this, right? Geek, but that, geek is <laughs> jumped up and she's wagging her tail. <laughs> but she, she, we put the harness on and we got to the docks and we started walking. And she was nice and slow. She was really good. And, and the instructions were like, oh, this is really nice. And then the heavens opened. And we got to a bench about about half a mile kind of onto our walk. And we had to sit down because we need a purpose for our walk. So we, we sit down on the bench in the pouring rain. And then we walked back again. And they said, do you know what, Amit? This could work. I'm like, okay. And so they, they said, well, in a, in a week, we'll put you in a hotel for two weeks, which is a new location for me and a new location for Kika. And that way we have to kind of work together. Um, two weeks came along. My wife at the time was working in New York. So she was in New York. My, my parents dropped me off to this hotel. They brought Kika in. And I'm like, I'm not sure if, if this is going to work. I'm not like, what happens if a squirrel runs across or someone with a football, you know, she sees a football, she's mm. going to go for the football, all these things. So I loved the idea of a dog. Never had one growing up because I was just too busy. But I liked the idea of one. But now having to trust a dog with my life, a whole different thing. Um, for the first couple of days of training, the instructor kept saying to me, Amit, you need to stop pulling back on the harness and let Kika do what she does. I'm like, yeah, but what if she walks me down the stairs without telling me there's stairs coming and walks me into a post? And like, no, 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 Kika will do How her thing. How would she tell you if there's stairs coming? She would just stop. <laughs> she would just oh. stop. Um, so all these little things that we're, we're learning to do together. And and in this time, for two days, she's been she's been sleeping in my hotel room. But nobody told me that she dreams and she gets up and she starts to kind of claw the carpet like she's digging a hole in her sleep. So you can imagine my my surprise uh, when I woke up the first night and all I can hear is someone digging a hole, kind of yeah. digging into the carpet. And I'm like, oh my God, what's happening? What's happening? And then found Kika doing this in her sleep. Um, wow. So she does a lot of that. Uh, <laughs> and she whimpers in her sleep and she oh. barks and she doesn't bark, but she barks in her sleep. She's so um, cute. But it was, it, was the third, it was the second or third day of our training. I woke up really early in the morning. I've got my hands against the wall in the, in, in the hotel room and I found the bathroom door. I, and, and Kika's standing right there. And this is about five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. She's standing in there blocking the door and I'm like, Kika, move out the way, move out the way. And she's like, I'm in none of it. And, and I'm like, come on, Kika. I'm like, I've got her collar. I'm just, Giving her a little tug and she's like, nope, not moving. She's stuck on the carpet. So I call my instructor who's also in the hotel room who did not be, appreciate being called at 5.30 in the morning to say, um, Kika's not moving out of the way. What do I do? And she's like, Amit, you're five times the size. I just literally pick her up and move her out of the way. I'm like, okay. So I've got my hands underneath her and I'm trying to lift her up and she's trying to push herself back down again. And eventually I move her out of the way, open the bathroom door and the bathroom is flooded. Water literally starts to pour out. Um, and it's, it was a marble floor as well. So I would have just opened the door and just, just walked yeah. in. Wouldn't even think about it. Um, and I'm like, oh, she knows me for two days. And she's looked out. That was the game changer for me. From then, it was, do you know what? Not, not 
ju- not doubt anything she's doing. Just yeah, just go with enough. it. And after after our training, we she kind of came back home with us. And just after we were qualified, we were supposed to go to Amsterdam for my my father in law's birthday. But obviously, Kika had just come into the family. The rest of the family all kind of gathered. I, I'm like, I'm good on my own. I've got Kika. Mm-hmm. One day we went out one day, and it was quite a windy day in Canary Wharf, and there were bollards that flew in front of us and behind us and we're near a dual carriageway and she stopped working and she sat on my foot and my wife and everybody are in in Amsterdam and I'm like what do I do I'm giving a command she's not moving so I call up guide dogs and I said is there a command to get the dog off your feet because she's 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 not listening to anything I say and they're like no I'm it we don't know what to do so I said all right I'm going to call the police so I called the police and I said I'm a blind guy with a guide dog who sat my foot who's not not wanting to move and I'm between here and here any chance you can get someone to come and find me I said don't worry I'm stay on the phone we'll find you five minutes later you hear the sirens you please pull up and they tell me that cones and bollards have flown in in front of us and behind us and she didn't want to go on the dual carriageway obviously because it's dangerous so it's the, the safest thing was to sit on my feet and say not to move and they said to me don't worry I'm it jump in the car and we'll drive you home so I'm in the in the police car with Kika Obviously, I have to call my wife. I'm yeah. like, Seema, I'm in the back of the police car. <laughs> it's my first journey out with Kiko on my own solo. But do you want to talk to a police officer? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, tell him we're going to prison. Tell him, tell him you're taking to the The guy's like, no, I can't say that. I'm like, yeah, tell him, tell him. Tell him. <laughs> See, like, I can hear you. <laughs> um, but but do you know what? what she is. She is the most amazing thing in them that's happened. Not, not did she just take the pressure off me going out on my own she took the pressure off my wife see i would call up Seema and say Seema, i i think i'm lost can you have a look on our gps app where i am and she's like oh i it. i think you've taken the wrong turn you're you're two miles away from where you think you are um you know so it it took so now Seema can be Seema yeah. and have a life again and not worrying about me but when kika first came to the house she absolutely hated Seema. Really? she saw Seema as a threat Aww. because Seema was working in new york quite a lot she was back and forth so kika's like well do I really need to get to know her? She's barely yeah. Yeah, ever here, you know. She might give me my meal once or twice. And when Seema would walk into a room, Kika would actually just push Seema away from me and just block her. And to the point where Seema was being tears, I'm just going, she doesn't love me. I'm like, oh. I, hopefully this will, this will kind of... Give it five years, Seema. Maybe. <laughs> just give it a bit of time. But the, t- the, the turning point was a couple of weeks before we found out we were expecting, Kika started getting close to Seema and, hu- and kind of getting... In with seems like oh she loves me she loves me then we found out we were expecting because Kika smelt the change in hormones yeah and then she was there for every appointment the first time she heard the baby's heartbeat her ears pricked up her head is on the on on my on on Seema's um chest um Aww. she was she was in the delivery room both times when when both my kids were born was she that's so amazing so she is the big sister she is honestly amazing I mean some of the things that you've told me today when you just say take me to Canary Wharf Station take me to the Shum, she knows. <laughs> And I noticed him pretty well. I can't believe that. I mean, yeah. I was like, does she understand everything you're saying? And you said she does, but she knows a bit of Gujarati. Was my mum? My mum being in Gujarati family. My mum. No you know, we, we, we talk to Kika in English. Yeah. My mum talks to Kika in Gujarati. That's I'm so like, funny. Okay, let's go, ma. I'll take you. That's um, so sweet. I mean. I love her. She's so sweet. And I'm so happy she liked me because I was very nervous <laughs> when you said she she either will like you or she won't. But yes. she was sitting by me for a long time. So I think I got the seat of approval. But one thing that really upset me was reading about the stigma, the um, inequality, and all of the things you've had to experience. I mean, you touched upon this a cup, uh, you know, at the start of this podcast. When you said people have spun you around, when you mm-hmm. said you've been mugged. I mean, you know, you told me a story earlier and it really brought me to tears. But one thing that I read you did was put a camera on Kika so that you could film people hurling abuse at you. You could see how people were being so rude to you on the train, on your bus, when you were not doing your normal, normal routine. Yeah. Just because you've lost your sight. I mean, I think it's disgusting. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I, think, I think that's what I was never prepared for. Um... You just don't it think was, people would do that. It wouldn't even cross my mind. No, it wouldn't cross my mind. And and it also it all started where Kika would come go onto a station or a platform or and she'll stop. And for me, it'll be very much oh you know we're here at seven o'clock in the morning. It's really busy. She's getting her bearings. You know we we don't always get on the same door on the tube every day. It's it's different. It depends on how many how many people are on the platform. So I I understand that she needs to get her bearings and she's only a couple of feet off the ground. So everything probably looks the same. And she's yeah. looking at the back of your feet. 
you know, back of your legs when she's walking around. Um, so it's still amazing me how she navigates all these um, underground stations. Um, but, it, you know, there was, there was times where she'll stand and she'll sit down. And I'm thinking, okay, Kika, get your bearings and then we'll go. Wouldn't think anything of it. This happened a few times. And then one day a lady came over to me and said, are you okay? I said, oh, yeah, I'm just waiting for my guide dog just to get her bearings. And she said to me, I don't think you realize, but your dog was just swiped with an umbrella. And that's why she sat down. And I said, oh, okay. And we went, we went to, um, we found a member of staff. She, she took me to a member of staff. They, they pulled up the CCTV and there was someone who deliberately saw her, moved over towards her and then swiped the umbrella as, as they walked past. Are you joking? Um, that is disgusting. So, so I got home and, I'm not, and, I, and I thought to myself, my job, my only job, when I'm out and about is to make sure she's okay because yeah. her job is to make sure I'm okay yeah. and I said I can't do that so I, and, I, and I was really upset and, and I said to my wife I said I said we need we need Kika's eye view I said we need we need to put a camera on her and see what what people re how they react when they're around her so we put a camera on her next day caught someone caught someone the next day caught someone the day afterwards even, even to the point where you go into a train station and you can hear members of staff talking and you say, excuse me, can I help you? And they turn, look at you and then carry on or walk away. Um, and we caught all of this. Um, and I'm like, well, I, just, I, I'm walking around naively thinking that this doesn't happen. You know, if you if you if you say can, if you turn to someone, and say, excuse me, can you can you help me or can you help me? You know, find a member of staff. You, you expect someone to say, oh, OK, if I can't, I'll, I'll find someone else. People will look at you, people. Well, and the worst one was where people were walking towards her and making Kika walk closer to the edge of the platform and seeing who would, you know, whether she would stop first or whether she would walk off the platform. Oh, uh, my gosh. And and people think that's a game. And uh, that that really upset me. And, and, and you know, you get, you get I, I get people who say to me, oh, you're worse than your dog. Or, you know, you should, disabled people shouldn't be allowed to use public transport at peak times. Uh, you know, what are you doing on the train at seven o'clock in the morning? No, what are you doing on a seven? You're going to work, same as me. So am I. Right? So am I. It, and, and, it, and it's that as well. Well, why, don't, why do you need to have a job? You know, and you kind of think, wow. Do you know what? For me, <laughs> it's, it's that whole thing where I, I'm, I'm very lucky that I've met, I'm, I meet some amazing people along my journey. And I work with charities because we talk, I talk, you know, all these things that I have problems with mm -hmm. are not just my problems. They're kind of a, this universal problem. And it's not just down to sight loss. It's about disability. It's the way people see, you know, so you might have, you know, I've, I've had people come up to me and say, I'll kill myself if I lost my sight. I'm like, okay, I don't know where to go from there. I have, really don't know how to answer that. I'm like, Okay. What what, uh, what do people expect you to say? Or or it's or, do you know what, it's it's funny. Or the worst, the funny thing is when you're when you're just ha stood there. How do you lose your sight? I'm like, sorry, are you talking to me? Yeah. Like, Hello, my name's Amit. Hello, how are you doing? <laughs> um, but what randomly someone will say that to you? Completely randomly. Or I remember being in being in like when you're in boots, get grabbing a sandwich, right? Yeah. I, can, I, I know where the fridges are because I can yeah. hear them. Yeah. I, know, I can so grab a bottle, yeah. like the bottle of waters and stuff. I can fill that. Not problem at all. Sandwiches. I can't. I don't know whether it's it's a chicken sandwich or a, yeah. you know or anything else. So I'm kind of standing there, and I, and I and I kind of in my in my heart of hearts kind of think someone next to me is going to say, "Can I help you?" They do, right? Ninety nine percent of the time they do, or a member of staff sees you, which is which is great. But then it's, oh, here's your sandwich. So how do you lose your sight? I'm like, I just wanted a sandwich. Yeah, I, just, I just uh, literally came to get my. This lunch. is not this is not your way in because you just helped me get a sandwich. Yeah. Um, but it's it's when you start looking at stats when it comes to unemployment. Yeah. Within the the visually impaired community, you know, you can you can be a visually impaired. Go to a mainstream school, college, university, come out with a degree, mm -hmm. yet can't get a job because people look at your disability as opposed to your. You could have a you can have a a first, and your your you know your 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 friends could have a two one, but they will get the job because because got, they yeah. because you've got a disability. Um, I remember seeing a stat, and it said only twenty seven percent of working age, blind, or partially sighted people are in work, compared to the fifty one percent of disabled people, and the seventy five percent and seventy five percent of the general population. Yeah, and only forty percent of employers are confident their recruitment processes are accessible to blind or partially sighted people, and ninety percent of people said that it would be difficult or impossible yeah. to hire someone. Uh, and that was that was on the back of a amazing report that. I'm a trustee for a, a, a charity called Vision Foundation, and they did this amazing report on on seeing people's abilities, not their disabilities. Yeah. And they did ask employers, are, you know, if if a, if a vision impaired person came in, 
would you be able to cope or would they be able to do the job? Um, mm -hmm. And they're like, no. And people don't realize that, you know, with assistive technology, with, with everything that's around at the moment, there's no, the only thing I can't, I can't drive a bus yet. Mm -hmm. Right, I can't drive a train. I, I I wouldn't put myself forward for those. Yeah, but there will be there's there's a million other jobs that I'm more than capable of doing with assistive technology, with the help and the resources that are available out there. But it's an easy option to go with someone who doesn't need that. Yeah. Um. Because we and it, and it's funny because I work with organisations who talk to me and say, I mean, oh, we we want to be a diverse workforce. We want we want so much you know, um, um, inclusion in our in our workforce. And I'm like, well, do you have any disabled people? No, 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 we don't have disabled people. Oh, they're not going to be able to do the job, but we want we want to be that, yeah. but they're not going to be able to. So we'll just go through the, the, the routines and the, and the conversations, yeah. but we're not really going to change anything. Mm -hmm. And that's the ones I walk away from. Yeah. Oh. it's. I mean, all the work you've done is incredible. You've written this book, which is amazing. And I think your journey is so inspiring for so many people because of your attitude, because of the way you approach any situation. I love this. No is not an answer. I mean, no. I try to adopt that quite a lot, yeah. but I think that it's very easy to say that, right? And I think... No no is the easy way out, right? I, I was I, just going to say, you know, a lot of people think saying yes is the hard part, but actually no is the no, easy way no. out. You, you say no, you walk away. Mm -hmm. Um and 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 I love. I remember pre COVID, I I was helping three vision impaired people into work. Um, they they were having issues when it came to uh, the interview. So I and they, they literally just called me up and said, I'm, I'm, "I've got an interview. I'm yeah. not confident." I'm like, "Don't worry, I'll be there. Yeah. I'll, I'll come along with you. No problem at all." So two blind people now are in this interview, and I'm yeah. just sat there just to give confidence. And this this young lady went through. She she had an amazing um um CV. She was. She was more than qualified for the for the job she was applying for. And then she got a letter saying, uh, we don't think that your assistive technology typewriter, which is a Braille keyboard, mm -hmm. is going to be compatible with our systems. Or actually, you know, you might not be able to work from home um, because our systems will say no. It's it's all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. COVID hit. A week later, everybody is now working from home. Yep. So I went back to this organization. I said, well, you told me this two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Now all this has changed. Can she not work for you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She can work for us now, and she right. she got and it, and it's that when when the masses need it, things change. Yeah. When the individual need it, it's it's more of a bother, mm -hmm. or it's it's people people are uncomfortable exactly. uh, around disability or around things that they don't know. Um. So for me, it's I'm I'm more than happy to answer questions. You know, don't ask me randomly on the street how do you lose your sight. Yeah. But if we're in an environment when you you're unsure, ask. Yeah. You know, don't don't assume that you your answer is going to be correct you know don't don't think that oh because he's blind he has to do it this way i might surprise you and also let's stop putting our limitations on other people right if i'm not able to do something it doesn't mean you're not able to do something and so why should i lead a conversation why should i assume that just because i'm unable just because i haven't thought about it just because i haven't found a way that you won't oh do you know what it's very much that it's for me it's it's boosting someone rather than holding them back it's uh, how can we help how can i help you exactly. what do you want to do in life right exactly. you know and then it's giving that 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 power to, to kind of energy to move forward no and you've given me exactly that today so <laughs> thank you so much for this incredible conversation for people who don't know he's got this book called kika and me i'll link it in the bio and the comment section so you can buy it and i'm just very grateful to have this conversation with you today so thank you oh my pleasure thank you so much my pleasure Yes. <laughs> yes, you do. I can subscribe. Yeah. yeah.